Wait, getting started. Okay, USB codec looks good. Just checking my audio and welcome to Q&A Friday. All right, everybody, it's um, a minute early. That's okay, because we're getting started. So hopefully you guys are, uh, we're going to end this weekend on a good note. Teresa, welcome. I hope you are doing well. Today is Q&A Friday, and we're going to go, we've got, a, I've got a, a few emails that came in and some questions. So we're going to, um, we're going to try to answer some of those questions. So we're going to do what we can with what we got and that's all we can do all right so first question um <clears throat> okay so guitar forever law guitar forever law hopefully that's a guitar player out there. all right so here we go this individual says the following. Hi, Thomas. This is a bit off topic with regard to this video's title. And okay, I came across your YouTube channel and found it really good. Thank you very much. I've just finished one of your vi old videos on short circuit calculations and plan to move on sequentially. Well, there's a lot of videos out there. So, um, Guitar for Evalol. I think you um gonna be a busy, busy uh person. We're trying to watch everything sequentially. <laughs> That's gonna be tough. Anyway, but um hope you're up for the challenge. Okay, so it says I'm aware of series ratings between breakers and its cascading effects. Series ratings between breakers and its cascading effects. I'm not sure I understand that sentence, but uh, let's read on. However, we also have manufacturers doing series rating combinations between breakers and switch disconnects. Since switch disconnects do not interrupt fault currents, what does this imply for the switch disconnect in terms of short circuit withstand capability? And short circuit current rating. All right, so I get I get where they're going. Okay, and then short circuit current rating. In the catalogs, the short circuit current rating of the switch protected by, for example, a fuse, is always higher than its short circuit withstand rating. One thing I need clarification is if the switch disconnect short circuit current rating is, for example, 30,000 amps when protected by, let's say, a 150 amp fuse, with a rated conditional current of 100,000 amps, then my understanding is that the switch disconnect is able to take 30,000 let through current. If it can take 30,000 let through current, why then is the short circuit withstand rating much lower on average? Sorry, I'm quite new to this. All right, so let's. Um, Let's start this one off. It's a great question. First off, it's a good question. Um, short circuit current ratings withstand fuses protecting switches, circuit breakers protecting switches, fuses protecting circuit breakers. It can be confusing. So I understand where this individual is coming from. Um, so what I'm going to try to do, I'm going to try to add uh, some clarity. So, now I have to just think about how I am going to do that. All right, so let's talk about what a short circuit current rating is. Close that computer, because I don't need it. I don't think I do. <clears throat> All right. Let me look at my, I need my materials, my present, 
presentation. So I got pictures. I got uh, file professional engineer, codes and standards, tutorials, IAEI presentations, but I don't have my presentation. And I'm not sure why. Where are my files? What are the documents? All right. So for some reason, oh, well, there they are. I called them technical presentations. They don't begin with a P. They begin with a T. Technical. All right. So short circuit current rating. Now, this image might help. This image might uh, okay so here we go here we go teach and monitor three all right so hey paul great to see you and teresa is in okay so here's the thing when you think about short circuit current ratings this individual had a lot of questions around um, an overcurrent protective device protecting a piece of equipment like that box that's there. When you when you have oh you know what here no you know here's here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna use my analogy. I am going to use my analogy, which is a weightlifter. Okay. When you think about a, a, a bench pressing, and you think about a, a weightlifter example, the the thing you should that you should see in your mind when when you think about a, um, a, a somebody who's bench pressing weights, you have the person who's laying down on the on the um, on the bench. You have. The person who's laying on the bench is your distribution equipment. Think of that as your switch. Uh, and and he, was bringing, he was talking about a switch. Think about the weights being the magnetic forces that are impressed on the switch when current passes through it. And then you think about the spotter as the overcurrent protective device. Now, this is how I explain short circuit current readings. Now, if you, if you think about, now just think about, picture that in your mind, and what if I told you that I could bench press 500 pounds when spotted by Lou Ferrigno? Okay, so if I told you I can bench press 500 pounds when spotted by Lou Ferrigno, what's going through your mind is Tom's never actually going to see 500 pounds. That's... That's 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 probably a reality because what's going to happen is if Lou Ferrigno is my spotter or Arnold Schwarzenegger, whoever you want to put in that position, who can handle 500 pounds, when the weights go on my arms, he's going to watch my eyes bulge and he's going to go, this guy can't handle this. And he's going to remove the weights. So technically, I never saw 500 pounds. If you think about it with regard to what a um, a waveform looks like, this is six cycles. The blue is six cycles of fault current that that would pass through a piece of equipment. Consider that five hundred pounds that would have been placed on my on my arms. And if I have my spotter. I'll never see 500 pounds. If you have the right overcurrent protective device protecting that equipment, it will never see that fault current. Because what happens is the overcurrent protective device is going to operate and clear so fast that it only sees that little red blip. So if you if you go back to the question that was being asked by this guitar guy. I'm just going to go back. 
He says, or she says, I'm not sure. It's a guitar for Eva Law. I don't know if that's a guy or a gal. It says, um, it says, the short circuit current rating of the switch, protected by example uh, by a fuse, is always higher than its short circuit withstand rating. One thing I need clarification is if the switch disconnect short circuit current rating is, for example, 30,000 amps. Now, the, what they're saying is 30,000 amps with no overcurrent protective device. So this, this um, waveform is the peak is much less. It's not 100,000 amps or 200,000 amps. That peak would be much less for, say, 30,000 amps, much less than 200,000 amps of short circuit current. Right, that first half cycle was a doozy. So they're saying if it was rated for thirty thousand, then then the understanding is that the switch disconnect is able to take thirty thousand amps, meaning all six of those cycles, thirty thousand amps, no overcurrent protective device, and that that switch will hold together. If it can take thirty thousand amps let through current, then why then is the short circuit withstand rating much lower on an average ten thousand amps at one second? Ooh, ten thousand amps. Okay, so I don't know where the 30,000 came from because if you don't have an overcurrent protective device, you are going to have a 10,000 amp short circuit current rating. And that's basically grandfathered in, so to speak. Let me uh, just grab a switch. Um, Heavy duty safety switch. So we're looking at a heavy duty safety disconnect switch. Let's take a look at the catalog. Okay. All right. looking for the short circuit current rating of these switches. All of this is just the size. I might have to do a search. There's your width. Looking for the rating. F short circuit. All right, let's try SCCR. Nope. Short. Just so listen, we're gonna short circuit current readings. There we go. <coughs> safety switch. Uh you all recognize safety switch circuit breaker series rate uh, series connecting ratings. That's uh so here it is. For applications that require a UL listed short circuit current rating of 10,000 amps or less, an Eaton non fusible switch must be properly protected by any overcurrent protective device rated no greater than the ampere rating of the switch. So, so this is telling you that you have to have an overcurrent protective device at least at the rating. So if it's a 30 amp switch, you have to have a 30 amp, I don't know, circuit breaker or fuse, doesn't matter. And you can at least get 10,000 amps. But if you want more than 10,000 amps, then you need to employ a specific overcurrent protective device. For applications that require a UL listed short circuit current rating of greater than 10,000 amps, an Eaton non fusible switch must be properly protected by the appropriate class and size fuse noted. Otherwise, this non-fusible switch must be replaced with an Eaton fusible switch that uses the appropriate fusing required. And what's happening? What is happening is when you have the overcurrent protective device, when you have a specific overcurrent protective device in, in, in uh, protecting that fusible switch, you will only see, for those high fault currents, you're only going to see that little red blip of current. Much less magnitude in the first half cycle, much less duration, less than a quarter cycle, 
and you're reducing the magnetic forces that are being placed on that switch. And we use this um, example, we use this video, we use 26,000 amps of fault current passing through a conductor. Right, so that's that's one cycle of fault current. That's a lot of magnetic forces. One cycle. So that's just one cycle. I was showing you a waveform of six cycles. So that those magnetic forces will rip apart components if they're not braced to be able to hold it together under those magnetic forces. When you apply a current limiting fuse like this 200 amp class uh, RK1 fuse. I'm gonna play that again. I'm gonna play this again. I want you to watch the very tip of, watch the very tip down below of the conductor. So you had very little force being placed on the equipment. You had very little force being placed on the equipment. And why is that? Because the fuse is limiting the amount of current that's passing through it. So guitar for Eva Law. <laughs> You got to remember that when you are when you are protecting a piece of equipment with a current limiting type of device like that fuse the equipment will never see that fault current because the device clears so fast if you don't have the appropriate overcurrent protective device ahead of it, the equipment is going to achieve an unintended rapid disassembly in the field, like this. All right, so that's, that's 65,000 amps passing through a piece of equipment that's not rated for it. The, the reason you're seeing all of this unintended rapid disassembly in the field is because the equipment can't handle the entire waveform. So you need an overcurrent protective device to chop that current down. Yeah, sorry about that, Muhammad. Thanks. I totally, uh, it was just a very loud one, so I, I had muted myself. All right, so let's take a look at, uh, this is a plastic, the next one's a plastic enclosure. 5,000 amps short circuit current rating and 35,000 amps passing through it. So in West Virginia, and West by God, smile when you say it, Virginia, we call them biggins. So what happened was the 
the equipment could not handle the full brunt force of this waveform. When you protect it by either a circuit breaker or a fuse, you're going to reduce that first half cycle down to something much more manageable. You're going to reduce the peak, that first half cycle, which is the most of the mechanical force that's on the equipment. You're going to reduce that peak and you're going to reduce the duration. So you're reducing the magnetic forces and the heat that's dissipated in that equipment. So the equipment never sees the 100,000 or 200,000 amps because the overcurrent device took care of it. Now, I can understand that it might be difficult when you're looking at equipment and their ratings and, and trying to answer this question that, that like, like uh, Guitar for Evalol says, um, it, they'll say the terms of short circuit withstand capability, half a second or one second. So, you're not going to see that half a second. That equipment, because of the overcurrent protective device, doesn't see that much current. Now, here's the real question, which nobody tests for. Okay, when we, when we have a piece of equipment that's rated, say, 200,000 amps, and we put an overcurrent protective device in front of it, we're testing it up, say, 200,000 amps, because that's the short circuit current rating we're going for. But if you think about that fuse curve, what about, to your point, what about the 30,000 amps, which will have a longer dur duration because depending upon where you're at on the fuse curve, right? So if we, um, let's grab a fuse curve. Let's grab Eaton um, fuse curve. Oh, oh, I do, I do, I do. Hold on. I had to put my my SCAM key in. Not glowing red. That's not a good sign. Oh, it says device is ready. So let me see if I have SKM on this computer. Because what I'll do is if I have it. Power, power tools. There, yeah, let's see if it works. Local green. I don't know if it's going to work. Um, I'm not seeing it. But what I'm trying to what I'm trying to say is, and it's not um, it's not glowing red. All right, well, I can't do that. Um, my other uh, computer is upstairs that has SKM, so I can't do that. Let's look up Eaton Fuse Curve. Fuses, time current characteristic curves. And let's see, class, we'll use a class J. Well, none of the links are um, are working. Okay. Well, what I'm trying to say is where the where the the time current characteristic curve crosses 0.01 seconds. Anything to the left is non-current limiting. So if I had a 30 amp fuse, a 30 amp 30 amp is probably going to cross 0.01 seconds around, I don't know, about 300 amps, somewhere in that ballpark. And if that's the case, then 
if you have 30,000 amps, you're still in the current limiting region. And you're going to be protecting that, that fusible switch, that 30 amp fusible switch. Um, it's never going to see 30,000 amps. It's only going to see a very short blip of current. So hopefully that helps answer that question. Um, now, um, you know, uh, we've, we've been known to use for static equipment, like a switch, like if it's a safety disconnect switch, there's no dynamic nature of it. I can use up, over, and down, uh, meaning my current limitation, my, um, my let-through curves. I'm not sure if I have a let-through curve in here. So let's take a look at a class. Let's look at Busman, class, J fuse. All right, so let's do this. I'm looking at a Busman Class J fuse. Let's go look at resources and product notification specifications, technical data sheets. Let's take a look at uh, let's look at this. That's a fuse holder. I don't want the fuse holder. Uh, Busman Series Class J DFJ. Uh, how about a JKS? All right. This is a fast acting fuse. And there's a 30 amp, right? So let's see, it crosses around uh, 350 amps. So I was, I was close. I said 300. So there's your where it crosses 0.01 seconds is right around uh, 300. There's 400. So right around 350. So, and, and you're seeing double of me. I got to fix that. Hold on. I'm going to fix it. There we go. See that? There we go. All right. So around 350 amps is where any, any current greater than 350 amps is going to be in the current limiting region of the fuse. Now let's take a look. The, hopefully we have, there's the, there's the let through. Okay. So if you had 30,000 amps, 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, if I go up to the 30 amp fuse and I follow it over to the AB line and then back down again, that's going to limit the RMS let through at 30,000 amps of fault current. It's going to limit the RMS let through to around 12,000 amps. So if this is 10 and that's 20, uh, maybe not 12,000, about maybe 15,000 15, amps. 1500 amps. What am I talking about? 1500. So the let through waveform is going to be the equivalent of around 1500 amps. Now, 10,000, 20,000, 30,000. Let's go back up and over. The peak would be around 1000, 2000, 3000, about 3500 amps. That's where your peak will be. Because on these curves, these current limitation, uh, the current, this is your instantaneous peak let through current. And this is an RMS symmetrical amps let through. So I can determine for that 30 amp fuse at 10, 20, 30,000 amps up and over gives me the peak of that waveform and then up over and when I hit the AB line and down tells me that the RMS let through. Now if I'm you if I'm protecting a static piece of equipment, a, like not a circuit breaker or a or a, a motor starter, things like that that will try to separate their contacts, then as long as I go up, over, and down, and that number is less than the short circuit current rating with a standard, any type of overcurrent protective device, then I'm good to go. I'm protecting the equipment. And on, on that 10,000 amp switch, if you recall, it said, or 30 amp switch, uh, it was a 10,000 amp short circuit current rating based on any overcurrent protective device. So if I go up, over, and down, I could use this 30 amp fuse to protect that switch 
because it's a static device, I can go up, over, and down as long as when I go up, and what we mean by up, over, and down, I got 10,000, 20, I take 30,000, I go up, I hit the 30 amp fuse line, I come over to the AB line, and I come down, that tells me my RMS let through, that has to be less than the short circuit current rating of my equipment based upon any overcurrent protective device protecting it, which that number was 10,000 amps. I'm at around 1,500. I'm good to go. I could do the same thing for busway. I could do the same thing for a, um, a, 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 what do you call that, a, a terminal block, okay? But I can't do up, over, and down for, say, to show protecting a circuit breaker, all right? Because it's a dynamic device. They're both going to be opening their contacts. It, the, the, the downstream device is going to be opening, it, opening its contacts. It's going to limit the current. It's not going to be 10,000. It's going to be less. It gets a little bit dynamic. It's crazy there. And that would be ungood. So I can't, uh, I can't use up, over, and down to protect a circuit breaker. I can for a static device. All right. So, so that's, so, so, and then the look, there's my let through. Remember I said 10,000 let through RMS apparent? For the 30 amp fuse, 10,000 is around 1,000 amps. I said 1,500. For the 60 amp, it lets through 2,000 amps. Or no, 30,000. Uh, 30,000, I said 1,500, but it's around 2,000. So hopefully that helps clarify that for you. So, and that's how we, so in our little Q&A Friday today, we learned about current limitation. We learned about how to protect a static and how to determine the protection of a static piece of a component, like a busway or a switch or something of that nature, how to use the up, over, and down, or up and over. Why would I use up and over? Um, UL508A, I believe, requires on some components to use up and over in the peak. Uh, so, for example, if I'm using a 508A analysis and I have a terminal block, they'll take that 30,000 amps, go up and over, and then that number needs to be less than uh, say the rating for that uh, component uh, with any overcurrent protective device. It's just a, a higher number, um, more conservative, which is fine, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. All right. Hopefully, that answers Guitar Forever Law. All right. Hopefully, that answers that question. All right, there are times, so, so we got crawl spaces. Okay, love the videos. Thank you very much, Kyle, 1500. Speaking of kitchens being added to the AFCI list, which also requires GFCI protection, one problem is that many kitchens wired in the 70s and 80s, even some into the 90s, as well, have multi-wire brand circuits. All breaker manufacturers I'm aware of have two-pole GFCI breakers available. A handful have two-pole AFCI breakers available, but no manufacturers I've seen has a two-pole dual function. Any chance that could change in the future? Okay, here's what he's talking about. Do we know, okay, multi-wire brand circuit. If you're not sure what a multi-wire brand circuit is, this is when I will buy a conductor that has two hots, one neutral, and an equipment grounding conductor. There's four conductors in that sheath. So NM multi-wire branch. Take a look. I'm going to see if um, I can find a picture of it. I want an actual NM wire. I want to see what it looks like. I have it out in the shed, but I'm not going out in the shed and getting it. I should have read these questions ahead of time. Whoa. Is this good? Nope. Wow. You would have thunk. Here we go. Here it is. 
Well, I had a picture. And then it went away. How do I do this? Open a new tab. Nope, I don't want to open that. Because the moment I open it, here, here's what I'm going to do. All right, you see this right here? I got a black. I have a white. I have a red. The black and the red are the two hots. The white is the neutral. The, the bare copper conductor is my equipment grounding conductor. E G C. So what they would do is they would take two hots from the panel board and share a neutral so that they can power two different types of circuits, right? You might be able to power, um, and they would come off of two separate breakers. And where do, if you think about a standard thermomagnetic circuit breaker, where do you land the neutral? You don't land it on the breaker. You land the neutral phew, up there on the neutral bar. So you have two hots. They're both sharing current coming back on the neutral. That goes to the neutral bar. Everything is copacetic. Now you throw in GFCIs. And what does GFCI need? GFCI needs to know all the gazautas have to equal the, the comebackas, right? So what goes out on those two hots is coming back on that neutral. You need to have a donut around all of those conductors. And if you split that between two breakers, then any one of those two breakers is going to see current go out that doesn't equal to the current coming back. Maybe more current's coming back, maybe less. So, so what you need is you need a circuit breaker that can, for two poles, for one hot, two hots, landing one neutral, coming back. Inside that circuit breaker, we put a donut around all of them, and we measure the difference. So what, um, what Cal, is it Cal? Yes. What Cal 1500 is saying, he's saying, listen, um, for those applications, what would you do? You would put a circuit breaker in the panel board, say it's a GFCI or an AFCI. You would land your two hots on the circuit breaker. You'd land your neutral on the circuit breaker. And internal to that circuit breaker, we're monitoring both hots and the neutral. So you've got all of that taken care of. And I can provide GFCI, and I can provide an AFCI two-pole. But is there one that puts AF and GF, and we call those dual functions? Put all of that into one. So what is the value there? Is you can provide both GFCI and AFCI protection because both are required in these kitchen on these kitchen circuits, and you can get that done with one device. Kill two birds with one stone, and there's value there. And, the, and what's the value? If something trips, you're not hunting for where's the push buttons that I need to test. Go down to your panel board, open the door, it's right there. So now the question is, do we make Two-pole, AFCI, GF. So I'm going to search Eaton, AF, GF. Ooh. Um, Eaton, AF, GFs. Here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, start your engines. Let's see if Eaton makes an AF, GF. Uh, so now, what's the solution? If you don't have an AFGF circuit breaker, then you have to put one of the technologies in the breaker and one of the technologies in the receptacle. If you put the arc fault in the receptacle, then you've got to figure out what you're going to do with the home run circuit because it needs to be protected, either probably physically. You can put that in MC cable if you wanted to. Or you could put the arc fault protection at the breaker and put the ground fault down at the receptacle. So there's AFGF receptacles. Um, I'm not seeing, oh, these are the wiring devices, AFGF, wiring devices. I don't want, I'm looking for, I am looking for Eaton AFGF circuit breaker. It always helps to spell circuit breaker correctly. AFGF receptacles and breakers. All right, here we go. I'm only seeing single pole. One poles. One pole. One pole. 
It's a one pole solution for AFGF. All right, so let's take a look at um, Siemens AFGF circuit breakers. I don't think Siemens makes receptacles. So residential, dual function, conjunction, junction, what's your function? All right, so let's take a look at um, download the brochure. That's Surge. Well, I thought it would have been easier, but I guess it's not. Residential dual function circuit breakers. And a single pole. Ampere ratings, interrupting ratings, B11s, Q11s, all single poles. Uh, let's try ABB, AF, GF, circuit breaker. ABB. Dual function. I'm seeing one pole. Well, they call theirs a DFCI. That's confusing. Man, one pole. All right, so let's. The last one is Schneider. Schneider uh, AF GF circuit breaker. Night air. Night air. Dual function. Circuit breakers. Ooh, all one poles. So, well, I'm sorry to say that we only have single pole dual function devices. So, what that means is for kitchen applications, regardless of the manufacturer, you're going to take, this is what I would do. I would put ASCI in the circuit breaker. I would, I would put ASCI in the circuit breaker. On both of the circuits, maybe a two pole ASCI. Two pole AFCI feeding the kitchen. And then when you come off of the one leg, go to your GFCI receptacle and then all your receptacles downstream. And you need two circuits, right? So you need two, um, two receptacle circuits. Hey, David Engelhardt in the house. David, we we're just talking about AFGF and whether or not there's two poles. So. And there's no two-pole AFGFs. So you're going to do a two-pole AFCI on a shared neutral application on a multi-wire brand circuit. Go out to the kitchen. Land that one brand circuit on the first receptacle. Make it a GFCI receptacle. It'll protect everything downstream. Come off of the other. Go hit another GFCI uh, receptacle. It'll protect everything else downstream. Now you have both AF and GF protecting the kitchen for your uh, beautiful meals that you're going to be making, David uh, Engelhart, in your kitchen. So that was, uh, that was my Q&A. That was Kyle, 1500. Thank you, Kyle, for watching. And you love the videos, and I really appreciate the feedback. Um, all right. And Max Yield, Max says, please have Ryan Jackson on more often. Ryan Jackson, if you're out there, buddy, let's do a program. Uh, we are a uh, we are a pair to, uh, to to contend with. So let's get a program together. I'm game, Max. I'm game. We just got to get us. Uh... All right. So Kyle, fifteen hundred again. At my company, when we were using transformer KVA rating and impedance with percent impedance, we always use the worst case scenario for the purposes of doing an arc flash analysis. Looking forward to later today. So, Kyle, and what, what Kyle's talking about is, remember, the 
the impedance on a transformer, you will have plus and minus a percentage. You typically say 10%. The worst case for arc flash might be the higher percent impedance to drive the currents lower. That might give you your worst case. So, Kyle, um, kind of hard. And Ireland was in the house. David says, need to have a protection readily accessible, not behind a refrigerator. That's right, David. And remember, so here's the other thing. A lot of people forget about, let me show you something. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to go Eaton Ground Fault Device. A lot of people forget um, Oh, boy. Where are they? Models. Now, I know, I, you know, when people think of models, they're thinking of me, but we're talking receptacles, not this type of a model. All right. Where is it? I'm looking for, you know what they call it? I call it a faceless GSCI. I don't know what they call it. I don't know what the real term is. Oh my goodness. David Englehart. Because here, here, and here's the reason why I, I'm I'm going to this faceless GFCI. Some people will say they don't want to provide the opportunity to for anybody to plug anything else into the refrigerator circuit. So they don't want to put a receptacle that protects another receptacle because their fear is somebody might overload the circuit, trip the breaker, and then, oh, look, how easy was it for you to complete your product-related tasks? I'm going to say fairly easy. Um, all right. I'm looking for a faceless GFCI. And I should have said, not easy at all. Let me go to resources. Oh, look, look, oh, look at this. David. Look. A blank face. All I had to do is blank face GFCI. There we go. Look at these. These are, here it is, right here. Now, a dead front GFCI. Ryan Jackson. And your ears started burning. You should have because I got a request. We got to do more programs together. So brush off the books, buddy. Come on. Get with the program. So look at this. Now, this people forget about these devices. And I'll tell you, another place we use these are in your Haslock locations where you have those enclosures. You put the push buttons on the outside. This provides GFCI protection for anything connected downstream. It has an on-off button. So you could put one of these. Here's what you could do. You could, well, you could put one of these in your kitchen. Protect all the receptacles off of this. Put this in your kitchen, feeding the receptacle that's behind the refrigerator, and it provides GFCI protection. So you can get your GFCI out of this device and uh, provide protection. And you don't have to worry about somebody plugging anything into it. It's a blank face. Uh, or like uh, David Engelhardt says, dead front. Let's do it. Okay, listen, Ryan. Uh, and, and here's, oh, oh, Ryan, I got a beef. I got a beef. A beef to pick with you. Oh, my God. I got a beef to pick with you, brother. I love you. I love you lots. But, and I know this is an opinion-based thing. But you did a really good, really good video on ground fault circuit interrupters, 210.8. I think you said it was the first one for your new book. And remember, everybody got to go out and buy the Ryan Jackson book. So, <clears throat> but always buy the IAEI book first and then buy the Ryan Jackson book. But in any case, it's a great video. 
But here's my beef with you. You showed a picture. Two pictures. Yes, Paul, get your popcorn. So, Ryan Jackson, you showed two photos in your kitchen video of, you called it a window. Now, and I, you know, Bobby Joe, in fact, I had, you were on my computer, and Bobby Joe was in the living room with me, and, she, and we were both listening to Ryan talk about GFCI protection. And you called one a window, and there was another you called a doorway. The doorway did not have a door on it. It was like a pass-through. Just like this wall right here, that right there, that's, would you call this a doorway? I wouldn't call it a doorway. I wouldn't have called that, that pass-through a window. And, and, and so, I don't know, I, I, I'd love to know, and I know you probably have a very good argument on why you say it's a window, but if I look at the definition of a window, let's just look at that. I, I, I was going to do this, Webster's definition of a window. Webster definition, oh, I'm going to go to the Merriam-Webster, 11th edition of Collegiate Dictionary, because that is the dictionary that is referenced by the National Electrical Code. And I'm going to, because Merriam-Webster elected to make such fine, fine print, I'm going to need my spectacles. Now a window, Ryan, a window's definition, and I know I'm being anal retentive here, and you're probably rolling your eyes going, oh my God, what an idiot, UVW window and you might be right i didn't look up the definition of a window until just now so this could be tom just being um being tom and wrong a wrong tom a dumb tom window what is the definition for window it says an opening in the wall of a building for admission of light and air that is Whatever. Closed by casements or sashes containing transparent material as glass and capable of being opened and shut. That's a window. Now, um, here's the third definition. An opening as a shutter, slot, or valve that resembles or suggests a window. Or is the transparent panel so is it a window and you, and 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 your your reference was yeah David it's a cased opening i I would agree with that I would agree with a cased opening and then uh the other one was the doorway so uh a door what is the definition of a door? Ooh, there's a deer tick. Don't go by the definition of a deer tick because, it, I mean, there's an ugly picture of a deer tick. I just got the eebie-jeebies. A door. What is a door? Ladies and gentlemen, drum roll, please. A door. Not a donut. Not a dottle. Not a dove. Not a double genitive. Not a double agent. Not a... Dormer, not a dormant, but a door. Here we go, a door. On page 372, Merriam-Webster's Dictionary. A door. Swinging or sliding barrier by which an entry is closed and opened. Similar part of a piece of furniture. Doorway, doesn't have a definition, or I guess you have to go see doorway. A means of access or participation. That's a door. What's doorway? Doorway. The opening that a door closes. An entrance into a building or room. Especially. 
an entrance into it. So, uh, um, according to Miriam, it includes an opening and partition or wall through which business is conducted, such as a bank teller's window. Yeah, but bank teller's, bank teller window. Man, I'm going back to window again. Going back to window. I'm just having trouble with calling that a window. And then if you don't call it a window, I mean, do I like a large opening like the one behind you is not a door. Yeah, so these are not a doors. And, and the one that you had shown, I don't know if I'd call it, I don't know what you would call it. Um, so from a GFCI perspective, the, 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 the cable that passes through that opening, the cable, the cord that passes through that opening, and I'm not sure what I would call that, that opening. Can't say it's passing through a wall, because technically you're not. So um, that was the. Uh, for some reason, it just it just struck me when you said that, and I had never, in I had never, um, I had never thought about this before until that until I saw your video. Very good video, by the way. Very good video. I agree with you, Paul. <laughs> that for measurement stops, that could be a problem. No, I it's I don't know if it's a hole. In the wall, that and that was where I was going with it, Ryan. I'm saying, is that passing through a wall? Because the way, because the the term window is not defined, and the way that the um, the code language reads, the way the code language reads, it says, I'm just going to look at uh, the 2020 code. On my NFPA link, which works most of the time. So the what 210.8 reads is um, it says for the measurements, right? Connect to the would follow without piercing a floor, a wall, a ceiling, or a fixed barrier. Or the shortest path without passing through a window. Now, when I think window, I'm thinking window with a sash. I wasn't thinking window. Like I have up in my in my kitchen, I have a pass. I call it the pass-through for lack of, I don't know what to call it. And it's not, a, there's no encasement around it at all. It's just a hole in the wall, um, to your point. But when it says without pa piercing a floor or a wall, how do you pierce a wall? How do you pierce a floor? You drill a hole in the floor? How big does a hole have to be to say you're piercing the floor or no longer piercing the floor? Now you're going through a doorway. I, I don't know. So, so it really led me to question. In those applications where you had that picture, going through this opening in a wall in front like in my in my house it's uh, near the near the uh, sink and there's a, a square hole so that I can see into the living room is that piercing a wall or is that I mean it's in my opinion it's not a window So that's where my head was at. When I saw your video, um, which I thought was great, I mean, you went through each, all of the requirements, you did a great job, no complaints there. It's just, and the reason that one struck me was, uh, was because of the, because um, I have that same pass through. I mean, I, 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 we've never called it in, in, our, in our house, me and Bobby Joe, because I even asked her, I said, would you call that a window? And she said, no. And, um, and then I said, what would you call it? What, we call it a pass-through, which doesn't make sense. <laughs> but that's what we call it because there's no good name. Paul, thank you for joining. So anyway, there's a thing to explore, Ryan. And then that doorway. 
I mean, it says uh, we took doorway out. Because, and the reason we took doorway out was because, especially, I mean, a door. When we said pass through a door, and I'll never forget, in fact, uh, Massachusetts passed uh, an amendment that added the word that you don't have to GFCI protect anything behind a door. So that, tick, that picked up all of those uh, receptacles that are in the, um, the little garages, the appliance garages. But then I, I took and I made uh, an image for my PowerPoint presentation for Massachusetts. I put those little barn doors on the front of a receptacle. And, and I, said, I said, you don't need the GSCI protect any receptacle as long as you have these little barn doors in front of every receptacle in Massachusetts. So, uh, so you could do a cover plate on a receptacle and just put these little doors. They're like little, I put little, um, I'm not barn doors. I did, uh, um, you know, the old fashioned bar doors that you would see like in, um, uh, you know, in a bar, right? The swinging bar doors, you know, I put one of those in front of that receptacle and I'll tell you what, and I saw Fred Hartwell go, Hmm. But his, the language that they came up with, uh, that's all you have to do in Massachusetts. Just, um, is just put that, uh, put that, I don't know if they fixed it. How do you find Massachusetts language? Massachusetts code. Massachusetts uh, electrical code. Saloon doors. Yeah, saloon doors. All you have to do is um, put saloon doors uh, you just get a faceplate for put saloon doors, and then you wouldn't have to GFCI protect anything because they're behind a door. And uh, and um, I just thought that was funny. State electrical code amendments for the 2020. Let's take a look at what they did. <clears throat> and I'm going to do a control F for door. Oh, yes. There it is. So Massachusetts says, uh, for the purpose of when determining distance from receptacles, the distance shall be measured as the shortest path. The supply cord of equipment connected to the receptacle will follow without piercing a floor, wall, ceiling, fixed barrier, or without passing through a cabinet door opening, doorway, or window. They clarified it. I think the, uh, the one before that was a little bit less, um, where's it at? A little less... I think it just said door. So they did, uh, they did revise it. Yes. <laughs> it's not for the untrained. Obviously, the person who made the language was untrained. But um, that was, that, that, that's just funny. But in any case, I'm not going to pick on anybody because uh, that's not right. We all make mistakes. And uh, that's perfectly fine. Okay, so... Let's go back to our questions. I just want to make sure I pick up all the, all the questions. So, um, oh, I got another. I got another person in. I have a digital marketer, social media expert, wants to connect with me on LinkedIn. So, Azizur Rahman. Digital marketer, social media expert, and SEO professional. Thanks for joining. And you found me, which means I don't need help with SEO. I'm pretty doggone good because you found me. And I don't do a daggone thing when it comes to SEO. So, thanks for the connection. And welcome to the team. All right. Mr. Azizor Rahman, welcome to the team, and hopefully you can join us, and we can all learn together about electrical safety. All right. All right. Uh, understand your emotions to improve your well-being at work. Another great word of wisdom. All right, so i got to go back to my YouTube studio and make sure I picked up. Those were two good, good, good questions. It's 3.03. I've been on for an hour. Uh, comments. Let's go back to comments. So that, a guitar for Eva Law. I'd love to know if you play guitar. So thank you for your viewing and comments. Kyle1500, thank you. Max Yield, thank you. 
for your comments. Dirty Mike? No, the Menti link. I, when, I, when you see any of my videos where I use Menti, Mentimeter, and I tell you to enter a code, if you're watching that video and it's not live, the Mentimeter, it's not going to do you any good. Don't do it. Ain't going to do it. 1,000 points of light. Don't need to. Um, and John Waters says, looking for this coordination through a transformer I keep talking about, where could it actually reside? Um, I will post the link. Uh, so I'll tell you how I find stuff. Uh, if you go to my channel and go to, I'm going to hit my channel, and you go to playlists. Boy, I have so many playlists. See, a lot of my playlists, you're, they're just for me, and they're not, um, they're not shown. Um, so how would I find it? If I go to, oh, I can search my search, and we'll say selective, selective coordination. Search my own. So there it is. There's the tables. There's the selective coordination deep dive. Tricks and tips. Transformer turns ratio. There's a 15 minute tech talk. Incident energy and the NEC. Wow. You know, transformer calculating full load amps. Fuseology. Jeez, oh man. Series ratings. Power systems analysis. Where is selective coordination through a transformer? There's Tech Tuesday. Uh oh, getting closer. Enclosed circuit breaker. That's when I, oh, I was wearing ties back then. Incident energy. Wow, do I have a lot? Oh, there it is. All right, I don't know if it. All right, um, let me do. Let me look. There is. Yep, there's my selecting. This is a 15 kVA transformer. You know what? I. I'm gonna have to make that video. You know what I think? I think I made it for. When I was for Busman, but I've not done it on my channel. So. I know what we're doing next week. We're going to do selective coordination through a, um, a transformer. Because I don't see it. Selective coordination transformer. There it is. All right. All right. 15 minutes. This, this is, okay, I've got it right here. All righty, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put this in the chat. Control C. Coming over here to the chat. All right, Ben. Control V. So here's the link. And I'll tell you the trick. How to selectively coordinate. This is fusers. Fusers. Gosh. Fuses for a, uh, for a transformer. And I know I did circuit breakers as well. And I'll tell you what the trick is, Ben. When you are doing selective coordination, oh yes, here it is, right here. All right. Um, oh man, this is good stuff. Selective coordination example. You know what? Here we go. We'll see. And this is on circuit breakers. New building inspector here. Excellent. Congratulations. Welcome. So, um, so Ben, when you're select, when you're determining selective coordination through a transformer, here's the key. I'm gonna pause this. Here's the key. 
and a lot of people don't realize this. So do you see that that downstream breaker, the, the B1, 2, 3, and 4, those are uh, on in the secondary panel board. It just came to the dark side. <laughs> Welcome to the dark side. So that circuit breaker, that B1, it's downstream, that branch or feeder that's downstream of the main in that secondary panel board. That breaker has to selectively coordinate with the breaker that's on the primary. To determine what needs to selectively coordinate, take the um, any two devices and determine if they both open, do you lose the same load? So B1 has to selectively coordinate with B5. B5 doesn't have to selectively coordinate with B6. B, B5 and 6, that's the main. B6 is the primary overcurrent protective device. B5 is the secondary overcurrent protective device. Those two, they lose the same load. But if, if a fault downstream of B1 opens B6, then you have a problem. And a lot of people forget to do that analysis. And then the trick is, here's the trick. When you have a fault on the secondary of a transformer, the primary breaker doesn't see that same value of current. The transformer does its job even during fault conditions. So the turns ratios still work. So for, in this case, 5,767 amps on the secondary, if that's a 480 to 208, if I have a short circuit on the secondary of this transformer and it's 5,767 amps, 5,767 amps. The primary breaker doesn't see 5,767 amps. The primary breaker only sees 5,767 times 208 divided by 480. 2,500. So, for a fault on the secondary, the primary breaker only sees 2,500 amps. The secondary breaker sees 5,767 amps. You have to do one of two different things. You have to make sure the instantaneous pickup of the primary breaker is greater than 2,500 amps. Then you know those contacts are going to be held closed on the primary, and that secondary breaker, that B1 breaker, will clear the fault very fast. Or if that 2,500 amps is in the instantaneous region, of that primary transformer breaker, then you've got to use the tables, but the value of current you go into the tables is not 5,767, it's 2,500. And if you don't know what the tables are, then you've got to watch another video of mine that talks about the, the tables. And the tables, I put that link in there, the selective coordination tables, there they are. There's the fuse table and, and circuit breaker tables, okay? So this is another one that you're gonna wanna watch. Control C, and I'll put it in there. Control V. What the selective coordination tables are, Got to go through this. Hold on. So what the circuit breaker selective coordination tables are and the fuse uh, selective coordination tables, we, we basically test breakers in series. And, and um, we test breakers in series. I'm just looking for there you go here's the table and what the tables do is basically <laughs> look, look at that mug jeez oh man i look like a gangsta um the downstream and upstream devices so the up like for an f-150 or an f uh an f-100 upstream of a 20 amp breaker anything greater than a thousand amps is going to trip those breakers 
that's basically what um, what those tables do. So that is um, you're going to want to watch that, and I'll here I'll I'll share this one too with you. We'll see and control V. All right, so that's that, and and and, and as, honestly, I got somebody trying to reach me. I'm not sure what it is for about, but I'm. Um, I'm going to have to make some phone calls back. So hopefully those few videos helped you out, and I appreciate you asking the question. Thanks, everybody else out there for asking questions. Thanks for Ryan. Take care. We're going to do a video soon, me and Ryan, and we will kick some butt. I'll have to give you a call, Ryan, and we'll figure out a topic. Maybe uh, 2023. I don't know. So anywho, let's talk soon. Thanks, everybody out there, for what you do for electrical industry. Thanks for what you do for electrical safety. Remember to stay safe and please stay healthy. Until next week, God bless.